Well, hello, Adult Sunday School Leader. Well, we made it back safely from South Carolina, but we had to leave a day early. My mom, she's in a nursing home where she's trying to rehab from when she broke her leg back on June 1st of last year. And it seems like as soon as she makes a little bit of progress, she gets an infection or COVID or something else and it sets her back. Well, while we were in South Carolina, she was taken to the ER, later put in ICU because of a really bad uh, UTI. After seven days, she's made some progress, but she's still in ICU. Now, in addition to that, our senior pastor is on a mission trip right now, and I'm preaching Sunday. So there have been a lot of other things taking precedence this week. So if you wondered why this prep talk is later than usual, now you know. Well, we're in a new unit. Okay, we're starting a new unit this week. It's called Being an Authentic Church. It's the first lesson. It's called Built on Christ out of 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And the point of the lesson is this. Everything in the church centers on Jesus Christ. Well, since I'm preaching this Sunday and I'm not teaching again this week, this prep talk may be a little in-depth in some areas and maybe some maybe sparse in some other verses. So my apologies ahead of time on that. Hey, um, back during COVID, June 21st, 2020, uh, the Sunday school lesson was on some of these verses. I think it started in verse 4 and went through, um, I don't know, it was about verse 15 or so. So it covered some of the same verses. So if you've got some notes back from that, you may not even have been even doing Sunday school then. But um, anyway, let's dig in. Now, as we start this unit on being an authentic church, let's first define what a church is. You may know this if you've been in church for a while. You probably have heard it in sermons. The Greek word is ecclesia, or ecclesia, which literally means one's called out. It's people. Now, I, I know you've heard it said, and, I, and it's true, that, that we may call the place where we meet a church, but really a church is the people, the people who meet at that place. So the point of the lesson Everything in the church centers on Jesus Christ is not just talking about every program that the church offers needs to be centered on Christ, even though, of course, that is true, but that everything in the church, the people, the ones called out, everything in the life of every believer, not the building, needs to be centered on Jesus. Now, realizing this makes the passage more personal it, it, about me, not just about us, okay? So, First Peter was written, written by Peter two Christians who were scattered among various provinces. Now, we can see that in 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, the opening verse of this, of this book. Now, by looking at Peter's life and reading his epistles, we can see the difference that the Holy Spirit made in his life. Think about Peter before Pentecost. He was impetuous. He was always putting his foot in his mouth before putting his brain into gear. He, he denied even knowing Jesus hours before the Messiah's execution. But after Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit came on him, we see a bold, uncompromising proclaimer of the gospel. Now, as we get into our lesson text for this week, I'm going to point out several times that Peter either quoted or referenced many Old Testament passages just in these 12 verses. Well, our first set of verses is 1 through 5. The first word is, therefore, and you know that. What do we do? We have to see what it's there for. The, the word, therefore, indicates that something was mentioned before whose consequences are defined after it. So in the last part of chapter 1, Peter urged his readers to live holy lives in reverence to God. He also reminded them in uh, chapter 1, verse 23, that they, were, that they have been born again. So since they, or now we, uh, were to live holy lives, therefore... Because of that, what do we do? We get rid of all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. That's a good reminder, maybe even some comfort, that even the first century church had to be reminded to make a conscious effort to put to death their sin nature. It's kind of like what Colossians 3, 5 says. Well, we just can't stop doing the negative. We've got to fill it with something positive. So instead of uh, or in, in addition to uh, getting rid of those things, what do we do? We crave that pure spiritual milk. Just as a newborn baby craves the nutrients necessary to grow and mature, those who are spiritually reborn should desire the pure nutrients, God's Word, to grow in their faith. Well, verse 3 is a reference to Psalm 34, verse 8. 
Peter's audience has already experienced God's goodness by accepting his salvation. They have tasted it. But that's not all they need to do. Salvation isn't the end. It's the beginning. And the more we taste the goodness of God, the more taste less that the things of the world become. Now, hopefully you've seen that in your lives, that what you once tolerated or maybe even enjoyed is now repulsive to you. Well, in verses 4 and 5, Peter refers to Jesus as a living stone and that believers are also living stones together uh, building a spiritual house. This reminds me of an illustration that I've used many times. I, I used to think that Christians were like bricks that comprised a wall and that the mortar that holds us together was the Holy Spirit. Then I, I remember using that illustration many times. Then it occurred to me that we, are, we aren't all the same. Unity doesn't mean uniformity. We aren't all the same size, shape, color, talents, all that thing. So instead of a brick wall, it occurred to me that we're more like a stone wall uh, composed of differing shapes. Some are quite large and quite noticeable. Others are small, uh, but vital to the integrity of the wall. But the Holy Spirit is still that mortar that binds us together. Well, our next set of verses is down in uh, verses 6 through 8. And in verse 6, Peter references Isaiah 28, 16. By using this verse, Peter is referring to Jesus as just not another stone in the wall, not to be confused with Pink Floyd's another brick in the wall. No, Jesus is the corner stone, the chief stone, the foundation. He is what the church is built on. But wait, you say, didn't Jesus say that Peter, the author of this epistle, was the rock that the church was built on in Matthew 16, 18? Well, no. Jesus said this, you are Peter, Petros, and on this rock, Petra, I will build my church. Now, Petros is that masculine noun. It's a small stone. Petra, it's a feminine noun. It's a large rock. It's a foundational boulder. Uh, Jesus did not say, you are Petros, and on this Petros, I will build my church. And he didn't say, you are Petros, and on you, I will build my church. He didn't say that. He used two different words. Now, Petra, that foundational boulder, uh, that's the noun that's used in Matthew 7, 24, when Jesus said that whoever put his words into practice was like the wise man who built his house upon a rock, built his house upon a Petra. You construct a building, you build a house on a large foundational stone, not a small rock. So what was the Petra that Jesus was referring to? Well, it was the confession that Peter made, just two verses before in Matthew 16, 16, when he said, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Everything in the church is based on the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus is the cornerstone. Well, our last uh, set of verses is uh, verses 9 through 12. Now, in Exodus 19, 6, God told Moses that Israel would be a kingdom of, of priests and a holy nation, which Peter refers to in there in verse 9. And if you're familiar with the story of Hosea and Gomer, you might recognize the reference that Peter makes here in verse 10. Uh, he says, you were once not a people, and now you are. Before you didn't have mercy, but now you have. God told Hosea to name his children not loved and not my people. But over in the next chapter in Hosea 2.25, it says, I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called not my loved one. I will say to those called not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. So there is another Old Testament reference. So the church the people, the ones called out, they are built on Christ. Christ is the cornerstone. We are living stones built on that, making up the church. And since we are built on Christ, the Holy One, the cornerstone, we are also to live those holy lives. We are to live separate lives. Get rid of those things that we're not supposed to do. I know we're still drawn back to those but let's get rid of let's work on getting rid of those. What is it we need to get rid of? What is it we need to stop doing? Now you might ask that as a rhetorical question. You may not want to hear the answers people have in their head on that. But, but have people just think about what is it you need to stop doing? And not just stop doing that, but what do you need to fill that in? What do you need to fill um, the, the bad thinking, the bad actions? What do you do? Well, you fill it with God's word. You fill it with 
those positive things. Think on these things, whatever is pure, holy, all that out of Philippians. Well, that's all I have for this week. Next week, we're going to continue in the unit on being on an authentic church, looking at Matthew 28, the Great Commission, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, as we learn about sharing Christ. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for your patience. Don't forget to pray for and with your class. Thank <laughs> you.